Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like everyone to please take your seats. I'd like to call the Health and Human Services Finance Division to order. We have a lot on our agenda today, so we'd like to get started. And uh, we do have a quorum present. And uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of March 20th, 2019? Representative Bierman moves approval of the minutes of March 20th, 2019. Is there any discussion to the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The motion prevails. Thank you. The minutes are approved. So um, we are today going to be hearing um, House File 2184, and that is the governor's budget bill for House and Human Services. And I am the author of the bill, but since I'm not really the, um, even though I'm the author, um, I don't have any personal testimony of my own on the bill. I'm going to be, um, we're going to be hearing from the commissioners and we're going to be taking public testimony. Therefore, I'm going to stay um, chairing the committee, which is a little bit unusual. Usually when the chair is, is the author of a bill, the chair goes to the table to present it. But this is a little bit different, so I hope that's okay with everybody. I'm just going to stay right here and we're going to hear the bill um, with the agencies presenting. And then we're going to hear extensively from the public. So just to give everyone a little bit of a road map, um, we're going to start with some brief presentations on the bill. And then what we're going to, and the members, by the way, have the bill before you in, uh, in a folder. It's a little bit unusual. You usually see just a pile of paper in your packet. But this, this book, which um, Ms. Niedernhofer and, and the pages have kindly put together for you, is, is the bill. So you've got it here for reference should you, should you want to refer to it as the testimony is going. I just do want to... Um, remind people of what the process is here. So this is the governor's budget. It is not the committee's omnibus bill. So at the end of the hearing, and, and the hearing will, we expect the hearing will actually go into the evening. We're going to try to get the public testimony in during our regular committee time. That's why we're limiting everyone to one minute on each topic. But um, at the end of our hearing today, the bill will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. And that means this is not the last time that the public will have a chance to discuss the provisions. It is not the last time that members will have an opportunity to offer an amendment. So I just want to make that very clear. Even though this bill is certainly about the size of what an omnibus bill might look like, this is not our omnibus bill. It's the governor's recommendations for what, what he would like to go in our omnibus bill. So just so members are clear and the public is clear on that. So after we have the presentations, we'll start with public testimony. Our agenda lays out um, the sections. The, we're going to do the testimony by topics. So on our agenda, we have topics in the order in which we will take them. We will take testimony from people that have given us their names as wanting to testify one minute per person per topic, please. And I, I realize it's very difficult to do, but in order to allow everyone to be heard, we need to really keep it to one minute, and we will be timing you, and we will ask you to stop when the minute is done. You'll, well, we'll ask you to complete the sentence you're on and then, and then stop. Um, at the end of each topic, we will allow members of the public to testify who are not on the list, but again, everyone will be limited to one minute on the topic that we're addressing at that point. So with that, um, I think Commissioner Malcolm is going to begin. Please come down, Commissioner. Welcome back to the committee. We've had the pleasure of seeing you quite a bit this week. and. Uh, would like you to go ahead and introduce yourself for the record and please begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Jan Malcolm, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Health. You have been extremely generous with your time uh, and we've really enjoyed the conversation over the last couple of days on, on issues that are so important to all of our state. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you very briefly again today about the governor's budget recommendations for MDH. The last few days, we've been talking about health insurance, how we pay for it, about what's driving up health care costs and what can be done to moderate them, how to get more value out of the spending we all make collectively in terms of the ultimate 
outcome of our health system, which ought to be the health of our people. Since the beginning of session, we've been talking about a wide range of topics, opioids, suicide, elder care, tobacco cessation, infectious disease, the capacity of our public health laboratory, managed care regulation, cannabis, drinking water, and health disparities. These are all critical issues. This list is broad, and the details can become blurred together and mind-numbingly complex when we're into the weeds on any of these very critical issues. But if you step back, you can actually see, I hope, that these health challenges have something in common, perhaps more than you might suspect. I believe we can perhaps advance the conversation by recognizing that there's a single major theme running through all of these issues, and that is our need to invest more in prevention. Prevention saves money. Prevention saves time. And most importantly of all, it saves lives. Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan understand the power of prevention, and you can truly see that theme running throughout their one Minnesota budget in all of the budget areas. In health and health care, this shows up in their recommendations by investing in programs that lower our rates of obesity and tobacco use, by investing in innovative approaches to reduce opioid dependence, by investing resources to strengthen drinking water protection, we can save communities across the state from having to find their own resources to do this critical function. By investing in modernized regulatory systems overseeing care facilities serving vulnerable adults, we can avoid the suffering and loss that come with abuse and neglect. In one way or another, that theme of prevention runs through every one of the items that we have described in previous hearings in the MDH budget. I just want to touch on a couple of those again. Um, as you know, part of the governor's uh, budget proposal centers on protection of vulnerable adults in care facilities in Minnesota. All Minnesotans have the right to live in dignity and free from harm, but in recent years, we collectively, and I, by we, I do mean we, we regulators, we policymakers, we members of the community, have collectively not always met that responsibility to protect seniors and vulnerable adults from maltreatment. By working with a broad group of stakeholders over the past few months, we've built really important agreements, I believe, on the need for not trivial changes, but structural changes in how we protect older and vulnerable adults. The governor's budget plan incorporates what we've learned from those community conversations and provides a vision for moving forward. The budget plan invests in required improvements to our regulatory capacity, but also modernizes our laws to deal with the increased popularity and complexity of assisted living settings in which 41,000 Minnesotans now reside. It holds providers accountable and gives residents and families more power and more information to make good choices. By adopting a new system of licensing assisted living facilities, Minnesota joins, will join the vast majority of states in providing greater regulatory oversight for this large, important, and growing industry that serves so many of our citizens. This investment in improving our regulatory system will help prevent maltreatment, leading to a stronger system of care for our loved ones and build confidence that our loved ones are getting the quality of care and the respect that they deserve. Another major component of the governor's budget proposal for MGH is, uh, is in drinking water. Keeping our drinking water safe is an absolutely fundamental task for state and local government. Failure to do this right has huge health and financial consequences, as a number of communities around the nation have been learning so painfully. Here in Minnesota, we have a unique and proactive approach. MDH is able to provide customized technical support and partnership for local drinking water systems, 7,000 public, public drinking water systems around the state, giving these systems tools they otherwise would likely not have to protect water and prevent contamination. To ensure that we can continue this innovative Minnesota approach, the governor's proposal includes an adjustment of the safe drinking water fee. The fee would increase by a modest penny per day per service connection, up to $9.72 per connection per year. I just want to reinforce that's per year, not per week, not per month, but per year. This prudent investment will allow the state to remain proactive in our work to protect drinking water, will importantly allow us to avoid shifting costs and technical burden to public water suppliers, many of whom are small business owners. A critical public health emergency that we've talked a lot about, and I appreciate the legislature's concern for this, is the opioid crisis in our state. 
in 2017, 422 more Minnesotans died from an opioid overdose. These numbers have been going steadily, inexorably up here and across the nation. Each one of those deaths carries a personal, family, and community cost. The governor's budget includes investments that can help turn the tide of this epidemic through provisions that ensure expanded access to life-saving naloxone, timely access to treatment for substance abuse disorder, and evidence-based prevention approaches in healthcare settings and in communities. Suicide rates are also going up in Minnesota, essentially at the same unacceptable, frightening, rapid pace of increase as deaths from alcohol, opioids, and other drugs, including methamphetamine. Every death from suicide is a family and a community loss that we mourn and that we wish we could have prevented. The governor's budget calls for an investment to support a comprehensive community-based suicide prevention program, building upon a public-private partnership to expand, strengthen, sustain, and support community-based suicide prevention strategies across Minnesota, including rebuilding an important state-based crisis response call system. The committee has heard separately about uh, the importance of retaining quitline services to, to help us continue to deal with the number one cause of preventable disease in Minnesota, tobacco use. Uh, so I won't dwell upon that, but, uh, but appreciate the time that you've given to that issue. We spent last night talking about the Health Care Access Fund and how important that is uh, to assure that we can continue to build on a foundational set of prevention strategies that now are reaching every part of our state with, with I think, extremely promising results. And the importance, and you've heard me say since the beginning of, of our time uh, with the committee earlier this session, that I just so firmly believe that a, a balanced approach to prevention and dealing with the problems that exist right before us is what we need to bend the cost curve over the long term. I firmly believe that the reason we're where we are today is because we have not, as a society, taken seriously enough the, uh, the ability and the imperative to, to work on the prevention side that what we've watched happen over the last decades as, as health behaviors um, have uh, led to a, a rising burden of chronic disease, we haven't done enough to understand how to support healthier behaviors in the context of communities and policies that support and make easier, healthier choices for our people. And that's really, I think, such a key strategy for, for bending that cost curve in the long haul. Madam Chair and members, I know uh, that you have heard in, in prior budget presentations, we've gone sort of line by line through each of our budget proposals. I would be delighted to answer your questions on any of it, but in view of your very precious time here today, I wanted to just hit a couple of the highlight themes. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, I will be happy to stand for questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We are gonna hold questions. Um, the, the way, so the way we're structuring the day uh, just so everyone understands this. We're going to have the presentations, we're going to take public testimony, and then we're going to take member questions and any amendments in, in probably in our evening session because I think most of our time will be taken up. And, and frankly, I think we find it really valuable to hear from the public and it may help frame some of our questions as well and help us understand the bill, you know, better. Excellent. So thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. And of course, I neglected to move the bill which is kind of important, so um, I, I am the author of it, so I will move that House File 2184 be laid over for possible inclusion in our division omnibus bill. So um, with that, I'd like to call up Commissioner Lori to um, discuss the DHS portion of the bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Three days in a row. This is, uh, I'm getting more comfortable up here and uh, glad to be here to present the uh, portions of the governor's budget um, in, in this capacity. Now, I understand we're trying to hit the highlights. It's pretty tough to 
go through line by line in a, in a, in a brief segment. So I'm going to uh, respect that uh, process and try to just cover this in sort of buckets of how we approached the, setting the governor's budget. The Governor Wall's budget for 20 and 21 uh, really strengthens human services by making investments that support the Department of Human Services mission to help people live in dignity and achieve their highest potential. And addressing the deep disparities in access and outcomes in Minnesota is a key uh, theme that you will see across the entirety of the budget as we um, begin to discuss it. As members may recall, the proposals in this bill represent an all funds impact of $274 million in, in the 20 and 21 biennium, which is an increase of 0.68% over our base budget for health and human services. So then to address the buckets, and I'll to say when I'm hitting each bucket, uh, the first one is uh, children and families. In this, in this uh, area, the bill invests $58.6 million of additional investments, uh, $42 million of which is in the child care uh, and program integrity portion. The new investments in this portion of the bill would help children and families in Minnesota thrive by several uh, initiatives. First, increasing the, the cash grant for MFIP by $100 per month. This would be the first um, cash grant assistance increase since 1986. It is long overdue. It has fallen far, far, far behind inflation during that 35 plus years. Uh, secondly, buying down the basic sliding fee uh, wait list for 1,000 families, um, improving quality and addressing continuing concerns around fraud um, is also a really critical piece of this part of the budget. Uh, in, in addition to increasing base rates uh, based on the most recent survey in our child care assistance program. This uh, children and families part of the proposals would also improve the child protection system by expanding the American Indian Child Welfare Initiative tribe status to an additional two tribes, as well as creating a child welfare training academy and working toward meeting the requirements of the federal Families First Prevention and Services Act in order to enhance and support children and families and really try to move some of those investments upstream and uh, keep families together. The bill, the second uh, larger bucket is the uh, $35 million in behavioral health care to improve access to treatment and care for Minnesotans struggling with serious mental illness or substance use disorder. Uh, it expands services to children through investments in school-linked mental health program as well as children's in intensive residential mental health treatment. Both those uh, programs that, that uh, are no longer funded by the federal side, we're going to uh, make up that with state funds and also expand our psychiatric residential treatment facility, um, currently capped at 150 beds over the course of the um, budget horizon. We're going to increase that by another 150 beds, as well as continue to expand the successful model of uh, CCBHCs, Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics in Minnesota, which provide coordinated care for substance use disorder and mental illness, as well as uh, um, uh, physical health. The budget also takes important steps in the behavioral health arena, trying to address the opioid epidemic with the new opioid stewardship fee. This bill invests in state grants to tribal nations and the five urban Indian tribal communities uh, to improve access, coordination, and referrals for culturally specific opioid services and adds a uh, opioid stewardship fee advisory council to help us distribute funds um, across the state to really be targeted at both um, some of the child protection uh, effects from the opioid crisis as well as um, treatment and uh, recovery efforts as, and prevention as well as uh, Commissioner Malcolm mentioned. The bill, the third, the next bucket, it strengthens services for vulnerable adults and people with disabilities through several changes and in investments, including $7.9 million for vulnerable adults and $45 million for long-term care services. The Governor Wall's budget works to ensure safe environments for vulnerable adults and encourages people to report suspected maltreatment. This includes adding staff to the Office of the Ombudsman for Long-Term Care, as well as making investments in the MARC system, the Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center, and additional information for consumers would also be available uh, through the, an assisted living report card built off the same model that we have for the uh, nursing facility report card. 
Um, there's also in this uh, package a proposal to reimagine how services are provided under the currently complex four separate waiver programs that would streamline services and another would address workforce challenges as well. Nursing homes also would have greater incentives to increase quality and or maintain uh, and, imp uh, and improve uh, their quality. The bill also, the next bucket, it preserves and enhances services for people in our direct care and treatment system with an $11.2 million additional investment in the 2021 biennium. This includes funding to continue uh, residential and vocational services to more than 1,000 people with disabilities in our, um, in our uh, MSOX facilities. Another proposal increases treatment capacity and simplifies the funding for our four state-run uh, ERTS systems, the intensive residential treatment facilities, uh, bringing them up to uh, their full 16-bed license capacity. Additionally, the budget uh, uh, has measures to uh, keep communities safe by funding the community preparation services and monitoring of sex offenders who are provisionally discharged by the courts. The next budget uh, bucket is uh, improving operations of state government so that we can better serve Minnesotans uh, this, uh, by investing $20 million in modernizing our technology systems and $936,000 in additional program integrity efforts. The updates to the technology systems to transform the human services delivery system would be uh, those aimed at making a system that is more integrated and more uh, person-centered, trying to keep the, the per run it, uh, for, the, for the benefit of people, not necessarily for the systems. The budget improves oversight of non-emergency medical transportation and other provider enrollment in state health care programs, as well as bolstering county fraud prevention efforts through additional grants. Uh, the final uh, package is the uh, comprehensive health offer offered through the One Care Minnesota, which we uh, jumped into a couple of days ago. Uh, so I'll cover this briefly. One Care is a package of proposals that addresses rising health care costs and improves access to care. It includes a statewide option to buy into comprehensive health care coverage that has the broad benefit set and, and broader networks similar to that in the Minnesota Care program, as well as additional buy-in options in any region of the state where the individual market fails to provide coverage choices for individuals living in those regions. And the One Care package also leverages the state's purchasing power to bring down prescription drug costs and create a simpler and more equitable model to help dentists serve all patients in their own communities and address disparities in dental care across the entire state. So that's the, the, the very brief run through. <laughs> Thank you very much, Commissioner Laurie. We appreciate the overview and uh, look forward to talking with you some more. And it's been uh, wonderful to have the three days, and uh, we know it won't be the last time you'll be here. That's, you know, I've enjoyed it myself very much. Thank All you, right, Madam good. Chair and members. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to turn now to public testimony. I would like to say to members of the public, if you have letters or other documents that you want to distribute to the committee, please give, the, give them to the page ahead of time if possible. And um, in order to facilitate everyone getting a chance to speak who wishes to, we're going to ask people to kind of get ready. Uh, I'm going to read off who we've got on the list and ask you to kind of come down and be ready um, for, to, to uh, do your testimony. So first on the list, first we're going to deal with the mental health issues in the in the bill, and we're going to start with Sue Abderholden. Next is Ginny Palin, then Rod Peterson, Linnea Mersch, Jennifer Gozi, and Stephanie Comby. And then um, after that, if uh, if there are other testifiers, we will take you as well, people who want to testify on mental health. So, Ms. Abderholden, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members, Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. Um, in the health department, we appreciate the investment, which we've not seen in years, for suicide mm -hmm. prevention. 
especially the network adequacy. We want to make sure that with health plans, the, the providers actually are alive and are taking new patients. We think that's helpful. And the tobacco cessation quit line. People with mental illness have the highest smoking rates. In the human services budget, um, you know, our mental health system isn't broken. It's never been built. And the things that are in there that we think will be helpful are increasing the funding for schooling to mental health, addressing the loss of federal Medicaid dollars for kids residential, including adding new PRTF beds, funding for certified community behavioral health clinics, funding for traditional healing practices for American Indians, increased funding for the transitions to community to move people out of state operated and off the waiting list from community hospitals, increasing the elderly waiver so we can have people who are over 65 actually move out of Anoka, uh, making sure that people who are leaving residential treatment are automatically eligible for housing supports so they aren't discharged to the streets. Okay. Please finish. I'm sorry, okay. it is really short. Boy, and I thought I was really going there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Ms. Avery Holden. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I'm Jenny Palin with the Minnesota Association of Community Mental Health Programs. We would like to say thank you to Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan for emphasizing mental health in this budget. In particular, a huge thank you for including certified community behavioral health clinics in the budget. Also, schooling mental health, um, the room and board funding for mental health programs under the CDCTF, um, adult and children's mental health grants, and the community-based prevention pilot program. To Article 7 for the Uniform Services Standards Act, um, we would like to thank the department and the governor for the changes they made to the diagnostic assessment requirements. There are several components that we're working on with DHS actively now on that, but they've been working well with us to hear our concerns and helping us find common ground. To our second response, we are disappointed that the proposal does not include um, a proposal to address the unsustainable reimbursement rates to the foundation of our mental health system as it currently stands. We agree with the long-term goals of the administration. We also know that those long-term goals will take several years to implement, and so we believe that there needs to be an approach that both helps us sustain provider services today as well as gets us to that long-term goal. But we look forward to working with the department and you all in moving this forward to build our mental health system. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Rod Peterson. Welcome Chair, Leveling and members of the committee, I'm Rod Peterson. I'm a county commissioner for Dodge County and chair of the AMC's Health and Human Services Policy Committee. I'm also chair for the Min Prairie County Alliance and sit on the South Country Health Alliance Board and also our county-owned nursing home. Uh, children's residential facilities. Counties recognize the tremendous need for services when it comes to mental health services for our children. Counties are responsible to help meet the needs of our children who have complex mental health conditions as we know there's great need. Currently we have kids on waiting lists or being sent to facilities out of state at enormous cost to counties. The recent end to federal reimbursement for services at the state's children residential treatment centers that are over 16 beds has created serious concerns. Counties would not be able to afford to cover 100% of costs for care for these intensive <coughs> services. We appreciate the continuation of funding. We also appreciate the proposal to help build capacity within the system to include psychiatric residential treatment facilities. These are a need, needed component to a full continuum um, um, of mental health care needed in our communities right. so that children have needed services. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry about the one minute time. It really is awkward, but I, I really appreciate everyone's efforts because we obviously have a lot of important folks to hear from. Please uh, go ahead. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair members. My name is Linnea Mersh. I'm the Director of Health and Human Services for St. Louis County, and I'm here today on behalf of St. Louis County on Micah and Maxa. And so also just to echo Commissioner Peterson's comments about the intensive children's mental health services included here. I know that later today this body will consider gap funding for the rema remainder of this biennium for these children's intensive services um, as a state funding, as you know, stops short. Um, however, the the governor's budget does not include this gap funding, but it does provide the sustaining and expanding access beyond this year um, through these services by extending that state funding to replace the, long, the lost federal funding through the coming years. And that is just critical, critical for your county partners. Thank you. All right, thank you. Did not use the whole minute. <laughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for hearing me today. My name is Dr. Jennifer Gozi. I'm a licensed psychologist and the Associate Director of Compliance and Quality Improvement at Washburn Center for Children, nonprofit mental health agency serving over 3,500 children a year. I'm here with you today to testify in support of the Uniform Standards and Mental Health section of this bill. 
This bill is crucial to the future of mental health, mental health regulation. One of our most time and resource demanding challenges as an agency is the rigid and impractical paperwork expectations required for billing services. Current standards do not account for simple things like human error, technology failure, or larger things like cultural differences uh, and barriers to treatment. The flexibility that this bill provides will certainly improve the continuity and quality of care for clients and the quality of life for providers. Additionally, updating and streamlining the rules and regulations is long overdue and will greatly improve efficiency for providers, which will lead to improved client care and access to services for more children and families. Thank, thank you. you very much. And uh, Stephanie Combe, uh, welcome. Yes, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Stephanie Combe. I'm the licensed independent clinical social worker and senior director of mental health services at St. David's Center. I also currently serve as the board president of Aspire Minnesota. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in support of um, the uniform services standards in this bill. Uh, for 20 years, I've been a leader of mental health services for children in the nonprofit se sector. I've also actively participated in CTSS committees with Aspire Minnesota. In these roles, I have experienced the focus of conversations among leaders shifting from the best treatment interventions to addressing ongoing challenges of compliance with the various requirements, often noted in various statutes and rules, at times conflicting, and most concerning, not focused on meeting the needs of those we serve. <coughs> One example is the individual treatment plan. Currently, the standards require that an ITP is reviewed every 90 days and signed by the parents or guardians. While on the surface, this seems very reasonable, in reality, it has had some unintended consequences. To accomplish the requirement, it requires parents who are uh, willing and able to engage consistently in a child's services and yeah. follow through. I need you to wrap up, please. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on this section of the bill, the mental health section? Welcome to the committee. Great. Uh, and, Madam uh, Chair. Give us your name. And members, thank you. I'm Dominic McQuarrie, Public Policy Manager at the Wilder Foundation. Uh, we want to testify in favor of the community, Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic section of the bill. Uh, as a CCBHC, we've seen the benefits of the integration of behavioral health and substance use and outpatient mental health, and it's been a huge help for us. So we're excited to see that continue and then hopefully expand in the bill. Also, uh, we'd <laughs> like to see the uniform service standards that are in the bill. Our current system is too fractured for both staff and participants to navigate uh, in a logical way. And we are hopeful that this will help push us in a direction where uh, we have a more cohesive system that serves people in the ways that they need. Additionally, uh, we're happy to see an expansion of the schooling to mental health uh, in this bill. And we're hopeful that throughout the process, we could uh, add the section that is in uh, Representative Edelson's House File 814 related to uh, specialized schools that are dealing with students with higher needs. So uh, like a lot of things in the bill and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And um, please be sure to see the page and make sure that um, they get your information before you go. And to everyone who testifies, we do need to capture your, if we haven't already, we need to get your name and your contact information. All right. Um, Thank you. We will turn to the MFIP and housing section of our testimony. And uh, we have on the list Jessica Webster, Senta Leff, Fatima Moore, Juliana Keene, Linnea Mersch, and Barty Wahi. Um, and, and then we will also allow other folks. So welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Jessica Webster. I'm a staff attorney with Legal Aid, and we stand in support of the governor's inclusion of an increase to the MFIP cash grant, which we've had a lot of conversation about in this committee. I think it's $100 in the governor's budget. Advocates would like to see that go further. And I'll just note that the governor uses general fund to fund the increase to MFIP, <coughs> and there's still a 50 to $54 million TANF reserve that could be used for that grant. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Webster. Um, next person, please, and yeah, if everyone could, please come down, yeah, if everyone could kind of get ready to, to go in order so that we can kind of keep things moving. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and committee members for the opportunity. My name is Senta Leff, and I'm here representing the Homes for All Coalition. Um, the administration's proposal leaves out vital investments to services that 
um, support and stabilize families, adults, and children who are at risk of homelessness. Yesterday, you might have heard that Wilder Research released their triannual homeless study, and the results are really alarming. Homelessness in Minnesota has increased by 10% since 2015, uh, and importantly, our unsheltered population has spiked dangerously in the same period. The total number of people not even in emergency shelter has increased by 62% folks who are actually outside uh, and the rate of unsh unsheltered children went up by 56%. Um, so these numbers uh, relay the stark reality that we already are aware of and it's a statewide issue. Um, I know last week you welcomed 850 uh -huh. advocates I'm from sorry, across Ms. the Webb, state. Rest, um, so thank you for con con the inclusion of House File 1043. Thank you, welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Fatima Moore and I'm the Public Policy Director at Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. MCH is pleased to see a $100 increase in the Minnesota Family Investment Program, um, which is included in Article 20 of the Governor's Budget. As you know, MFIP cash assistance has not increased since 1986. Um, I was five years old at the time. The maximum level of assistance for a family of three is just $532 a month. This is definitely a program that many families access who are working low wage jobs. It's essentially a de facto unemployment insurance for many families. Um, and we are hopeful that this will be the year where we do see an increase in the MFIP cash assistance grant. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, Juliana Keene and then Linnea Mersch. Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Juliana Keene. I'm speaking on behalf of Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota. Uh, LSS has been providing services to people with disabilities, older adults, children, youth, and families uh, for over 115 years. Over 150 years, our 2,300 employees and 8,000 volunteers provide services in every Minnesota county. And I would also like to speak in support of the increased investment in MFIP. This would significantly impact LSS's employment services participants, their children, and Minnesota's communities as a whole. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the department and the governor's office for including this increase in the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the committee. Uh, Madam Chair, members, counties do applaud the governor's effort to make some immediate in investments that will assist in getting families the resources they need. You know, just to point to note, St. Louis County, specifically our department, funded in two warming centers this winter due to the unsheltered numbers in St. Louis County, north and south. We appreciate the governor's proposed investments in children and families. This 100 per month increase in MFIP is only the beginning, but an important step in helping working families on their way towards self-sufficiency. Thank you. All right, thank you. And you are Linnea Mersch, right? Yes. All right, thank you. All right, is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on the, oh, I'm sorry, who did I miss here? Oh, I'm sorry, Barty Wally, Wahi. No can... problem. Um, hi, sorry. my name is Barty Wahi. I'm the executive director of the Children's Defense Fund. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for the chance to speak. Um, I am here today to talk about our, um, uh, uh, to express our gratitude to the governor um, and the lieutenant governor on their increase in the MFIP cash grant. Um, uh, as uh, other testifiers said, the cash grant has not increased in some time. I was a little bit older than Fatima, but um, not by much. And uh, MFIP uh, is a children's issue. 71% of the children accessing the M MFIP program are children. Right. So uh, and more than half of the MFIP households have children under the age of six and have 10% uh, have infants. So this is an issue that really supports uh, children's economic stability and viability moving forward. You know, we appreciate an increase that is larger than $100, but we are grateful that the governor has included this in his budget. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And then um, welcome to the committee. Just please give us your name and who you're affiliated with and go ahead with your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ann Krisnick with the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition representing people of faith across the state of Minnesota. You've heard about the importance of the AMFIP grant. I want to make sure that it's clear that it's working. The average stay on AMFIP is about 10 months, so families are successfully using AMFIP as it's designed as a safety net as they move into economic stability. You've also heard about the extensive number of children on MFIP. We know that 80% of brain development happens in the first three years of life, and we want to make sure those children have adequate 
nutrition and shelter and care during that time. Um, I'll just close by saying we really appreciate the governor's uh, uh, increase in the Genship Grant because the current grant is really failing to meet our obligation to provide human dignity to these children and families. Thank you. All right, thank you. And, and just a reminder to everyone, please be sure to sign in with the pages so that we, uh, and you'll, you're being followed by a page right now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, we're going to turn now to direct care and treatment portion of the bill, and uh, we're going to have Eric Hesse and uh, Laura Sales, Rod Peterson, and then we'll open it up for anyone else. Welcome to the committee. Hello, and thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Eric Hesse, and I work as a security council lead at the Minnesota Sex Offender Program in St. Peter. I'm also vice president of Ask Me Local 404. I'm here to support the pros funding increase in the governor's budget for the sex offender program. Mm -hmm. For me, this is a workplace safety issue as staffing levels are already dangerously low. At times, there are staff alone, left alone on the unit with up to 30 clients for two to three hours. There are also staff that even work alone for the whole shift. The staffing shortage is partly due to the unfunded expansion of community preparation services and reintegration service programs. Expanding these programs was a matter of public safety because DHS in the state of Minnesota was on the verge of being court ordered to release dangerous sex offenders back into your communities. This funding increase will largely be used to fund existing unfunded positions. If DHS does not get its funding, the dangerous staffing levels will be maintained and I fear they may even get worse. I believe that is a matter of when, not if, something horrible is going to happen due to these inadequate staffing numbers. We shouldn't have to be injured for you to listen to us about our safety in our workplace. And I encourage you all to take the proactive report right. approach and help fix this issue. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Hi, my name is Laura Sales and I'm with the Minnesota Nurses Association. You should have a letter that has a lot more information about uh, the things that we're following in the budget. But for now, we're here in support of the proposal to increase the funding for the Minnesota Sex Offender Treatment Program and the MSOC's operating adjustment. Uh, MNA nurses are part of the staff that help ensure the patients in these programs who can be some of the state's most vulnerable patients or that the state is court ordered to care for receive quality care. Uh, because the community preparation services and the reintegration services have not received any specific appropriations in past budgets, the program has needed to reduce the number of direct care positions to stay within their budgets. So funding these two services will mean that current program resources can be used for direct care positions. And then we'll, we're also in support of the MSOX operating ad adjustment. This would allow the program to provide ongoing funding for approved salary, insurance, and pension payments for the program. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, Welcome committee back. members, I'm Rod Peterson, dot, dot, dot. Um, we want to, for the AMC, we want to raise our concerns about the 25% cost share for the counties to help cover the cost of care for clients who are provisionally discharged from the Minnesota Sex Offenders Program. Counties support state budget solutions which avoid adding or shifting a burden to counties through cost shift, cost shares, and unfunded mandates. Because when a cost shift is applied, the workload does not go down for our county staff. Local property taxpayers just make up the difference. Counties have long cautioned an over reliance on local property taxes to not, to not be a stable or equitable way to fund human services for the long term. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anyone else in the room who wanted to testify on direct care and treatment? Okay, not seeing anybody. So we will go on to the child care portion of the bill. And we have Ann Krisnick, Elizabeth Bangert, Jessica Webster, Barty Wahi, Cindy Cunningham, <coughs> and I think that's, that's all we have on the list at this time. So Ms. Krisnick, I think you're on, thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, hello again. I'm Ann Krisnick with the Joint Religious Legislative Coalition, but I'm speaking on behalf of the broader Kids Can't Wait Coalition. We appreciate the governor's commitment to the CCAP program. Um, it, it, not only the changes in policy addressing families experiencing homelessness, those who move from county to county, allowing people to move off MFIT more quickly, but also recognizing the importance of moving the families off the waiting list. There are currently over 2,100 families on the MFIP waiting list and the governor's budget would address 1,000 of those. It also would raise the market rate when we're looking at reimbursement to a current market rate instead of 2011. We know that access to child care is key for families moving into economic stability and as well key for employers to be able to fill positions. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Welcome to the committee. 
Uh, my name is Elizabeth Bangard. I'm the owner and director of Here We Grow Early Childhood Center in Mankato. And 60 seconds is not enough time to talk about any of these bills. So this is like some messed up version of speed dating for legislation. That's literally what this is. This is a joke to the public who have actual thoughts to share. I've listened to nothing but nonstop agencies for the last two months, and I think this whole entire process is asinine. I have over 7,000 pages of data about what's happening inside the Office of Inspector General, including the other individuals who oversee licensing and other things up there. So maybe we should address the actual maltreatment that's being hidden, the parent, the people who have four-star parent-aware ratings that have over 16 counts of maltreatment, the fact that there's massive rampant fraud, and that one agency oversees all of them. So enjoy your view from your balcony and your house of cards, because 52 card pickups about to happen. Thank you for your testimony. Jessica Webster. Wow. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, my name is Jessica Webster. I'm a staff attorney with Legal Aid, and we stand in support of the investments in child care in this bill for all the reasons that Ms. Kersnick said. It's, uh, these are important investments, and uh, they're for children. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Hiwaki. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm here again to talk about children and um, uh, the fact that the ch uh, the uh, child care assistance program is actually a two-generation approach. It supports parents and their ability to go to work. It also supports children and their development. Um, we support, uh, we're grateful that the governor has put this uh, in his budget and uh, really uh, hope the committee will consider both the family-friendly provisions that are tied to the federal conformity. We need to get into compliance with the federal um, uh, block grant, so we support those elements. And then finally, um, as Ms. Kresnick said, uh, there are 2,100 children still waiting to receive this program. We are very interested in ensuring all children who need this program can access it, and we uh, and support the governor's investment in, in reducing the number of children on the wait list. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I mispronounced your name. Could you just say your name into the thing? Because I, I think I blew it. So please say your name. No, you were super close. Um, my name is Barty Wahi from the Children's Defense Fund. Thank you. Okay. Welcome to the committee. Hi. Cindy Cunningham. I'm the Public Policy Chair for McPinn. It's the 501c3 Association for Family Child Care Providers. I'm going to speak a little bit. There's policy in here as much as budget. Um, so a few uh, things to go on record for policy. The use of the terminology emergency substitutes within the, the uh, bill is being changed by DHS, and I trust that that amendment and other wording gets changed on that to help providers. Uh, current substitutes and other care providers will need time to be able to be assimilated into the training program or training expectations. Um, supervision of, or excuse me, for substitutes is being changed from days to hours. That would allow me, instead of counting my two hours here today as a full day, it can be two hours. However, it would be advantageous um, to increase those hours to a 400 or 500 rather than 300. A couple bills that are not included that would be budgetary items that have been working, looking through the rest of the session. Um, an obits person for providers to be able to talk to, a uh, plain language handbook, handbook, excuse me, a tier system model of, of monitoring. Okay. And regarding CCAP yeah. um, as a provider um, that didn't it be in the fraud. To wrap up, I'm, sorry. I'm asking for more than a couple years. I get seven years off of the food program if I do a problem with that. Thank you. And, and it was just a reminder to everyone in the room that we also will be happy to take your comments in writing. This is not the only opportunity. And uh, especially for people that really have uh, more extensive things to say, please do give it to us in writing as well, either today or later on. Um, okay, so we are finished with the child care portion. We have child welfare. And, oh, and I'm sorry, I did not ask if there's anyone else in the room who wants to talk about child care. Welcome back. Didn't want to miss my shot. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm Dominic <laughs> McQuarrie, with, uh, Public Policy Manager at the Wilder Foundation. We're very happy to see the investments in CCAP as a member of the Kids Can't Wait Coalition. Um, and finally, a big investment and opportunity to address some of the wait list uh, issues that we have in the state. Additionally, because I did miss my chance on this earlier, I want to thank uh, the inclusion of the MFIP increase to the cash grant. It's been far too long, and we would like to see that go uh, even further if possible. And also, uh, you know, we're hopeful that by the end of session, we'll see an investment in some of the housing programs that are under the purview of this committee. Uh, as the Wilder Foundation, you know, we do this three-year survey, which was released yesterday, and as Ms. Left said, the numbers were alarming in what we're seeing across the state. So we still have time the session to address this, and we're hopeful that the committee will do, will do so. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wanted to speak about child care? Okay. Um, we'll move to child welfare then. 
Oh, Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, I understand the time constraints fully. I've been in your position as well. Uh, this is the people's house and we need to hear from the people. I'm wondering, will there be another opportunity for people to weigh in on this bill? I understand this is the governor's rex as you made very, very clearly, but will there be another opportunity in this, uh, in this process? <laughs> Thank you, Representative Hamilton. Just, just to put another point on it, absolutely there will be more opportunities. First of all, um, some of these uh, bills have been heard and will be heard either in this committee or in our child care subdivision. So there will be much more attention to a lot of these issues we've already heard about today. But not only that, when the committee comes out with our omnibus bill, we will again take testimony on what does end up in our bill and there will be a full opportunity for members to amend the bill so therefore people who are unhappy with various provisions can talk to members about offering an amendment as well. So there is, you know, the process we have here as we all know is not a perfect process but we do, we do try within the limits of our human capabilities to, um, to bring in as much uh, input as we possibly can. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you, Representative Hamilton. Um, so um, we're gonna move on now to child welfare. And we've got Debbie Harris and Linnea Mersch. Please come down. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I've got, let's see, I think things got turned around a bit. So anyway, go ahead. Uh, we've got people who are testifying on child welfare, and that's Linnea Mersch. Okay. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, members, thank you. We applaud the governor's proposed investments in the Child Welfare Training Academy. In St. Louis County, we have 60% of our child welfare, child protection workers who are new to their position in 18 months. This is really big for counties. Um, the committee has also heard information from the Casey Family Programs and others about Families First. Uh, Prevention Service Act or Families First, this is huge. Counties see these federal resources as an opportunity to make monumental changes in our child welfare, to ensure that we're supporting families before children's, ch children enter out of home placement and that we're really stabilizing families to promote child safety. Uh, the governor did propose some infrastructure costs for our state to prepare for the most efficient, effective use of these federal dollars and this federal flexibility. And we appreciate this proposal because we think it's key for counties and other stakeholders to be at the table. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your testimony. Was there anyone else who wanted to address sections in the bill that have to do with child welfare? Okay. Not seeing anybody. So we will move on to the SEIU contract. Please come down and introduce yourself for the record. Hi, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Patsy Gibson. I am a home care worker for Bloomington. I'm a member of the SEIU Healthcare Minnesota. I support the House File 2184 and specifically the section that ratifies and funds the contract for self-directed home care. I would like to thank the legislator of both parties who co-authored our standalone bill. I've been doing this job for six years. It's hard to care for someone else when you can't hardly afford to care for your own family. Right now, your paycheck is spent before you get it. If you get sick or need medicine, the copay and dedu deductibles can eat your whole paycheck. I have to go to the food pantry to make sure I get enough to eat. We bargained a new contract with the state of self-directed workers. It moved the minimum wage from 12 to 13.25, fund pay and training, boost pays for time off, holidays and more. I, it won't solve the crisis, but it's a great step toward it's a great step forward for the 29,000 home care workers who are covered by the contract. The bill for $36 million to pay for this contract. This okay. also includes tens of thousands of okay. traditional. I'm sorry, I have to ask you to wrap okay. up. Thank you. Thank you Madam very Chair much for, members. for your testimony. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak to the SEIU health care contract or the SEIU contract portion of the bill? Okay, I'm not seeing anybody. So we will go to the long-term care, vulnerable adults and disability portion of the bill. And I think this is where we had Debbie Harris, then Sean Burke, Toby Pearson, Carrie Thurlow, Juliana Keene, Phil Griffin. 
are the people on my list. So if you could kind of get ready to come down, that would be, that would be great. Um, welcome to the committee. Welcome. Please give us your name and go ahead. Hi, Madam Chairman um, and members. My name is Debbie Harris. I'm a board member of the ARC Minnesota. My son Josh is there sleeping in the corner. <laughs> um, we are grateful to the Department of Human Services for their work on the provisions of importance to members of the disability community to improve access to services, choice, and budget control included in the House File 2184. Um, at 2184, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> 2184, um, uh, for members of the disability community, 2184, um, I would like to highlight, however, some concerns with Article 5, Section 45, 44 and 45 of the bill outlining the proposed configure, reconfiguration of waivers for people with disabilities. Um, I know how critical waivers are in keeping people at home in their communities, even in the most complicated situations. Through Josh's CAC waiver, um, in order to mitigate the nursing shortage, we use a mix of nursing and enhanced PCA services to provide the safety, comfort, and continuity of care that Josh needs to live a fulfilled life and to avoid unplanned hospitalizations. We acknowledge that the department intends to recalibrate the budgets and make changes to the assessments that determine those budgets, but seek reassurance that the meaningful opportunities for stakeholder input will be prioritized okay. during these processes. And we look forward to working with the department to address those concerns okay. at a more detailed level and greatly appreciate partnership with future. Thank you very much Thank you. for your testimony. Okay, we have uh, Sean Burke. Welcome. And if everybody else could kind of get ready, Toby Pearson, Carrie Thurlow, Juliana Keene, and Phil Griffin. Welcome. Madam Chair, members, my name is Sean Burke. I'm the Policy Director at the Minnesota Elder Justice Center. I'm talking specifically on Article 13, Adult Protection. We're well aware of the abuse and neglect issues in long-term care facilities and the reforms going on at the Office of Health Facility Complaints. But OHFC is only one of the lead investigative agencies that are empowered to investigate maltreatment. We rely on counties and tribes to investigate the majority of our state's maltreatment complaints that oftentimes happen in people's own homes and are perpetrated by caregivers and unfortunately loved ones. And unlike child protection, adult protection does not get dedicated federal funding. We rely on counties to fund a majority of this work, sometimes up to 70, 80, 90 percent of the APS services in a county. This sets us up for disparities both within counties and between counties. This bill goes a long ways to address that. Aside from adding more funding to APS units, state funding, these changes will allow tribes for the first time to access this funding. It'll tie the grant to specific measurable casework, and we will ensure that the funds do not supplant current existing county funds, so it will actually increase adult protection work. While we think the governor's proposal can be more aggressive in funding this, it's great to see much needed work for adult protection. Thank you very Thank you. much. Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, members, my name is Toby Pearson with Care Providers in Minnesota and the Long-Term Care Imperative. Under Governor Wall's budget, nursing homes will lose more than $200 million in funding. $68 million cut from the state budget, a matching dollar from the federal money, and because of rate equalization, a matching private pay dollar. These cuts will have the greatest impact on employee wages and benefits and training. These proposed changes are in spite of the fact that the Department of Human Services' own report states that changes to value-based reimbursement system are premature because trends in the spending, access, and workforce are still developing. VBR has been a huge success in CNA wages going up more than 26%, LPN and RN wages going up, up more than 20%, full-time employees covered by employer-sponsored health insurance going up 10%. Despite this, we still continue to struggle with workforce issues. The proposed cuts come in several ways. First, the changes to the care-related limits and quality score. While we applaud the direction and the increase, the incentives to quality, in our opinion, the blunt instrument approach taken by the governor's Mr. proposal is not acceptable. Mr. Pearson, Second, I need you to wrap up, please. In short, in the midst of a $1 billion surplus, cuts to nursing homes and long-term care, especially their employees, do not make sense. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. 
Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Carrie Thurlow with Leading Age Minnesota here on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative. My comments will focus on Article 14, which proposes uh, significant changes to the way we regulate assisted living licensure. While we are pleased that the governor is prioritizing elder care protection and assisted living um, regulations and support the overall goal of increasing accountability and clarity for families and residents, the language in this bill right now does not reflect the emerging consensus of stakeholder work and at this time, we cannot support this language. This is a work in progress, and I want to emphasize that we are meeting with stakeholder groups on a weekly basis. And as this proposal moves through the legislature, we encourage you to make sure that um, remember that these are home and community based services, not institutions, that we need to keep seniors at the center of this who are capable of choice and independence while also protecting safety. Um, we need to protect access and affordability um, and making sure that we are not having the opposite impact of potentially creating unsafe situations um, while also increasing um, fees um, massively uh, as the language stands right. today. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Thurlow. Okay, um, Juliana Keene and then Phil Griffin. Madam Chair, members of the committee, again, I'm Juliana Keene from Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota. In the area of disability services, we greatly appreciate the inclusion of a competitive workforce factor uh, for those accessing home and community-based services. As you're aware, we are experiencing a crisis in staffing like we have never seen before. The competitive workforce factor will begin to address the 17% wage disparity between direct support professionals and those of similar jobs in the same communities. While working to solve the current issues in our fee-for-service model, we also strongly support the language in line 182.14, which directs DHS to study and recommend value-based models and outcome-based payment strategies in HCBS. We know that people's lives are more complicated than fee-for-service allows, and exploring other models could better ensure people with disabilities have the best possible outcomes, and we think it could also lower per-person costs. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect timing there. Um, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair members. My name is Phil Griffin. I'm appearing today on behalf of Cassia, the new organization created by the merger of Elam Care and Bethesda. The governor's proposed budget makes changes to the property payment rate that will make it impossible for providers to rely on our partnership with the state to modernize our homes for our residents. The problem simply stated is that current law allows a provider to close a facility, saving the state significant Medicaid expenditures. The state calculates a saving to the budget and shares some of that savings with the provider. The provider can then use those savings to make improvements to another nursing home. The current law supports a long-standing goal of reducing the number of nursing home beds and improves the ones that remain. Closures have been made, money has been borrowed, and seniors are relying on the legislature to continue funding these constructions and all future projects. Please reject this proposed change of funding for our elderly. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'll yield my uh, significant five seconds to another witness. All right, thank you, Mr. Griffin. Is there anyone else in the room who wanted to testify on long-term care? vulnerable adult provisions and or disability provisions. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Sarah Grafstrom. I'm the Director of State and Federal Policy at ARM. Um, first and foremost, I want to be here to express our support and gratitude for Governor Walls and his administration in including a competitive workforce factor in the disability waiver rate system. Um, my prepared remarks very much mirror Ms. Keene's prepared remarks, um, so I will shorten them by saying the competitive workforce factor is a very important step in beginning to address the wage gap that direct support professionals are currently facing. I do, however, want to highlight our concerns with the governor's proposal to increase licensing fees for 245D providers. Preliminary analysis of the proposed fee schedule shows an average increase in licensing fees among our members of 61%, with fee increases for individual providers ranging from 20% to 300%. Um, our members are dedicated to providing the highest quality of services to individuals with disabilities. We understand and support the need to have appropriate licensing visits. However, a fee increase this drastic is problematic to providers. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Joe Cuoco. I am with uh, the Vice President of Supportive Living Solutions. I'm here speaking on the issue of the waiver reimagine project. We are, we are asking to postpone a decision on the waiver uh, reimagine project 
with all the changes it creates, such as discontinuing independent living skills services, which about 25% of people on waiver receive, the removal of the ILS specialist, the creation of the two waiver buckets, which are a residential support waiver and individual support wa waiver that inadvertently creates loss of crucial services. We feel there needs to be more discussion with stakeholders to ensure continued services to the people of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who wanted to testify in this area of the bill? Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Susie Emmert, but I'm actually here on behalf of Melissa Haley. She's a parent advocate who asked me to testify for her because she could not find PCA support for her child this afternoon. And as a parent advocate and board member of the Minnesota Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities, or MNCCD, a broad-based coalition of advocacy organizations and service providers, we work to change public policy to improve the lives of people with disabilities. Um, in a few areas that we wanted to note, Section 33, Article 5 establishes the competitive workforce factor that you've heard quite a lot about in this committee, and so we're pleased to see that. Um, we'd also like to note that we have a strong hope that the process around the waiver reimagine work um, will include continued and robust engagement of the disability community statewide. And then we are also pleased to see that um, in Section 2, Article 20, that the Health Care Access um, Fund is, con is considered to continue, and we really want to see that um, continue as well. So so we want to say that we are grateful to the Department of Human Services for their openness um, to stakeholder feedback and their ongoing responsiveness to our questions um, through this process, and we look forward to working together. Thank you very much for your testimony. <laughs> Is there anyone else who wants to talk about those sections of the bill, long-term care, vulnerable adults, disability sections? Okay, and I, I know these folks are not coming down for that, so. Okay, so we will move to the durable <laughs> medical equipment section, and I have on the list, unless there's been a change. Okay, I, what about, okay, okay, very good. Mr. Newman, welcome to the committee. Yes, Madam Chair, representatives. Um, I'm here to discuss the $8 million proposed in cuts to uh, durable medical and equipment based on um, unsustainable pricing derived from a national competitive bidding program, which is imploded, it's currently suspended, um, based on widespread unaccessibility to our equipment supplies in rural America. Um, the other part of that cost savings comes from a cost plus 20 that the department insists on pushing. You have rejected twice, the Senate has rejected twice, and there's a Judge Castro in Ramsey County currently has a temporary restraining order until you guys weigh in on a cost plus 20 program. No company in the United States in this service-based industry can survive on a cost plus 20 basis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony. I had, um, and, and Mr. Newman, I don't think you said your name into the record. Could you just tell us your name? My name's Al Newman, um, currently representing MAME's Eighth State um, Organization of Medical Equipment okay. and Supply. Thank you very much. Um, I had Sarah Anderson, but please go ahead. Yeah. Um, Sarah Anderson is a board member of MAME's. She was not able to make it today because um, her company, Home Care Delivered, is closing down all their medical equipment and supply operations in Minnesota. So it's been a very rapid closing. And some of you know Sarah from testifying over the years. Um, her family business, Key Medical, had to shutter its doors in the summer of 2017 when the uh, preferred incontinence program um, was uh, passed into law. Their creditors um, saw that and they closed them within 36 hours. When that happens, um, those patients and their provide, their caregivers and their families are in an absolute scramble to find the right providers. Not all providers have the same products um, available. So it really creates quite a bit of chaos. Um, we did have a conversation with the department before <clears throat> this hearing. Um, in House File 1580, Edelson and Zeros are carrying um, Maybe the alternative to this across the board I'm cut. I have to ask you to wrap it, up, wrap it up, but you didn't say your name on the record, so I'll give you those few seconds. Please tell us who you are. Bill Amberg representing Mains. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, oh, and, and Mr. Amberg, and I, we got some documents, and I assume that these are 
these are from you. Am I right? Yep. Okay. And so members have some documents in front of you regarding that issue. Um, so is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to testify on the durable medical equipment portion of the bill? And I'm not seeing anyone on that. Okay. We will move then to the health care sections of the bill. So the lineup that I have right now is Jessica Webster, Mary Crinky, Laura Sales, Rod Peterson, Alita Borud, and then we'll ask for any other testifiers who are interested in coming down. So welcome to the committee, Ms. Webster. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jessica Webster. I'm a staff attorney with Legal Aid. And we just wanted to speak in support of the direction of an inclusion of one care. And we're particularly uh, grateful in this budget for the provision that addresses dental access. Legal Aid has been long, long working on dental access across the state. And we think that's a really important provision. So thank you for hearing this testimony today. And we appreciate many of the inclusions in the governor's budget. Thank you very much for your testimony. Ms. Crinky. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Mary Crinky and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. Three quick items that I would like to mention. The first one, there's a small provision on page 367 that is important to hospitals. It brings Minnesota into compliance with a new federal rule regarding how the feds will pay for outpatient drugs for Medicaid pay patients. Um, there's a small increase for the DISH hospitals. That's disproportionate share hospitals. These are the hospitals that have the highest Medicaid volumes in the state. It's to help offset just some of the losses that will be experienced with the new federal outpatient drug rule due to increased acquisition costs of very expensive drugs. In particular, these are cancer drugs for children's hospitals, HIV drugs, and blood clotting drugs for hemophiliacs for our safety net programs. Uh, Chair Liebling has a bill on this, a separate bill, House File 1297, that we are supporting. The second item that I would like to mention is on page 419. This is regarding increased license fees for hospitals as well as a one $125 fee for every prescriber of any medication. This is to support the opioid program. I heard that the rationale for this was yeah. that providers needed to have skin in the game. I would like to point out yeah. that hospitals have plenty of skin in the game. Last year there were 1,400 babies born in Minnesota hospitals that were opioid addicted and our ER volumes have gone to 36,000 per year. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And. Uh, uh, Okay, thank you for that testimony. Ms. Sales, please go ahead and please say your name. Hi, hi again, my name is Laura Sales. I'm with the Minnesota Nurses Association. Um, we've testified to other committees that we're pleased to see the one care proposal as it's also car carried in House File 3 as amended. Uh, we'll leverage the state's purchasing power for prescription drugs. Additionally, the dental plan included in one care will create equitable, equitable rates as well as raise rates to help assure statewide access to dental care. Uh, we're especially interested in continuing to learn how OneCare will work in regards to third-party administrators. We continue to advocate for direct contracting with providers to get the best deal for Minnesotans and ensure that healthcare professionals, not insurance companies, are driving patient treatment. While it's not in the bill, we're in strong support of the governor's proposal to eliminate the sunset on the provider tax. Uh, without that, many of the goals of this budget would be impossible. Thanks. Thank you very much for your testimony and Mr. Peterson. Madam back. Chair, committee members, Rod Peterson with AMC. I'm just going to talk about the provider tax. If it's not broke, don't fix it. The provider tax works. Don't break it. Um, so I'm, this committee spent time last night discussing the importance of programming that is resourced by the health care access fund. A priority for counties in May is maintaining health care access fund to maintain access to critical health care and prevention services. Extending the provider tax is paramount. We support principles of financial stability and the quality of the programs the health care access fund has made possible. If the fund is unable to support these programs, counties will not be able to absorb the cost and therefore millions of Minnesota's laws lose viable services. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Alita Borud, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Alita Borud, a physician and member of the Healthcare Committee of Land Stewardship Project, an organization supporting family farmers. I do that work because despite the current crises for farmers, affordability and access to health care remains the number one issue for our member farmers. I'm here to support Article 9, Section 13, Subdivision 1, regarding the One Care Buy-In. Specifically, people need access to comprehensive quality care, which would 
be offered with the 90% actuarial value plan with the benefits uh, set similar to Minnesota Care. In the hospital, I cared for many farmers who presented with very advanced disease because they simply couldn't afford to access their care due to high deductibles or they couldn't access care locally due to restrictive networks. These problems in the individual market would be much improved with a public insurance program, One Care. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anyone else in the room who wanted to talk about the health care sections of the bill? Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for your time. Eric Dick with the Minnesota Medical Association. Wanted to briefly um, amplify something that you heard earlier from Ms. Crinky from the Hospital Association. Um, we at the MMA have some question about the, um, the registration for the prescribing for controlled substances. Um, this is a, a really um, quite substantial change in law. And should the committee be interested in considering that, we hope that you'll have a, um, a more uh, thorough hearing because it is quite a departure. Um, it's worth noting that prescribers, um, physicians and other prescribers are licensed by the health board. So there is some oversight of, of um, prescribers. Those that control uh, that prescribe controlled substances are also uh, required to have a DEA license and the accreditation process also um, serves as a, as a bit of oversight. So um, we think that these um, are really important issues that probably deserve a full hearing. Thank you very much Thank for you. your testimony. Um, the hot topic, health care. Anybody else in the room who wants to address that? Okay. Um, then we will move on to the sections that relate to the Department of Health, or at least that's, that's how we've categorized them here on the agenda, um, public health issues. Um, so we have Amanda Jansen. Okay, uh, so Amanda Jan Jansen and then Barty Wahi, and, uh, and then we'll open it up. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I'm Amanda Jansen with Clearway, Minnesota, as well as the Minnesotans for Smoke-Free Generation Coalition. We appreciate this opportunity to thank the governor and lieutenant governor for including funding for statewide quit smoking services in their budget proposal. As this committee has heard earlier this session, Clearway, Minnesota was established as a life limited organization and we will sunset by 2022. The quit smoking program we have operated for 28 years, excuse me, 18 years, known as quit plan services, will end in just over a year. Clearway, Minnesota is ready to pass the baton to the state to operate these services. Every state in the country provides quit smoking services. If the legislature does not take action this year, we will become the only state not providing them. We know that nearly 600,000 Minnesotans still smoke and nearly half want to quit. We are grateful to the governor for showing his commitment to the health and the state with this proposed funding. We support this proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, welcome back. Hi, I promised last time. <laughs> Um, okay. Again, uh, my name is Barty Wahi, and I am the executive director of the Children's Defense Fund. Uh, I'm back here again because, as you can see, one of the things we appreciate about the governor's budget is that it centers the experiences of children and family to improve child outcomes. Um, we are here to support the Community Solutions for Healthy Child Development Grant Program, uh, which is part of the, the bill. By 2035, one in four children in the state of Minnesota will be a child of color or American Indian child. They are our future leaders, but Minnesota faces some of the worst disparities um, uh, tied to child well-being for children of color and American Indian children in the country. Um, oftentimes these disparities exist because we in part have not been able to determine and understand how we best um, position our public policies in a way that leverage the assets and the strengths of communities. The Community Solutions Fund, uh, or Community Solutions Grant Program is an innovative way um, to really uh, create an investment strategy in communities themselves. It brings those who are most impacted by these disparities into the decision making process okay. so that we can address the unique and challenging needs that cultural communities uh, face um, to improve child outcomes from health uh, to education. Okay, I'm sorry, we have to ask you to wrap it up. Uh, uh, we just ask you to support this bill and um, to watch for House File 1381, um, uh, which we hope will be before you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there someone else who wants to testify on the public health portions? Welcome to the committee. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Brooke LaFlo. I'm a member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa, an aide at the Montessori American Indian Child Care Center, and a member of the Voices and Choices for Children Coalition. Voices and Choices is a coalition that focuses on improving outcomes for American Indian children and children of color ages 0 to 8. We focus on the implementation of policies and practices that meaningfully address these disparities that exist in Minnesota. In Article 12, we support the Community Solutions for Healthy Children Development Grant Program. Communities of color and American Indian communities have endured assimilation policies for centuries, ultimately leading to the dis disparity gaps we are seeing. Rarely are we included in these rooms. If nothing has improved without us besides growing disparity gaps, then is it not time to change something? Community Solutions Grant Program represents more than money. It also is recognition of communities of color, American Indian communities, and geographically dispersed communities have, that have valuable, invaluable knowledge and must be active and valued participants within the creation of solutions for themselves. Centering our solutions engages our community. Supporting our communities is critical because these children will be future leaders of our state. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there, some, is there anyone else who wants to speak to the uh, public health issues in the bill? Please come on up if you do. Welcome to the committee. Madam Chair, members, thank you. I'm Reverend Dr. Jean Lee, and actually, uh, my issues apply to both the health and human services in general. Um, you're going to be having some handouts. I won't get into the organizations I represent. It's in the handout. Um, I'm a former F Fortune 500 corporate auditor who switched to addressing the needs of the communities and people uh, in, who are unserved and underserved. Uh, using systems change to improve their lives and save uh, save lives. Um, there are two areas that I wanted to cover, uh, and this applies to both health and human services. One is that um, they need to retool how they're doing things, uh, in especially in response to the aging of America. And retooling means also redesigning their systems, their programs, services, and granting to better address the needs of individuals so that they could remain healthy in their homes and communities. Um, and this includes okay. expanding. We need you to wrap it up, please. OK. Includes expanding their knowledge and ability to access opportunities. You see an uh, amendment that we're proposing on the back. The governor and lieutenant governor have said that they uh, support the need for community solutions uh, and nonprofits willing to help. Um, we need to wrap it up because you're way, way over the minute now. Okay, well, yeah. the, the two can was one minute. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I ask that you also address the last uh, item, which I haven't had a chance to cover and will be covered later. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. So we have four minutes left in our hearing today. And is there anyone in the room who wants to testify generally on the bill as a whole? Um, or uh, so, okay. I'm not seeing anyone who wants to do that. So, um, so uh, members, we are scheduled to continue tonight if members would like to do that to have a discussion on the bill. And we certainly are open to doing that. Um, and um, we will... We will be reconvening after the floor session in room five. So um, I would say call of the chair in room five to have discussion on what we've heard today. I do want to um, just thank everyone who testified. Again, we apologize to keeping you to one minute. Obviously, it is difficult to do. Um, we really appreciate that. We appreciate that we did not get give any of you a full hearing. And... Um, but again, I want to emphasize this is not our only opportunity. And to let you know that, you know, every member of this committee is, I know, I know I can speak for them and say that they are open to hearing from you and your concerns. And we are a team and we will be talking more about every one of the issues that was discussed today. Um, Representative Franson, did you have a question? No, I can, I'll, I can wait. Okay, so we will be reconvening members at, um, after the floor session, call of the chair in room five. So with that, and with deep appreciation for all of you and for your outstanding cooperation in giving us very brief testimony today, the committee is in recess.